I called my talk the pragmatic text miner. And there's a little bit of a joke on that I'm, I don't really consider myself a text miner, actually. I, I often get referred to as a text mining expert, but I, I find that's a little bit like referring to a carpenter as being an expert on hammers. Because to me, text mining is just a tool. It's a tool I use to do what I want to do. So to the answer, quest, to the, the answer to the question, why text mining? For me, that's really what I want to do is data mining. What I would like to do is do the kind of guilt by association networks where we can link things together based on whatever evidence I can get my hands on to try to get an overview of biology on a very large scale. So this is my favorite guilt by association network. You probably can't read it from here. This is not a biology network. This is a network of people. If you look out here on the side, you'll see names of people, and they're linked to each other, and the evidence in this case is emails. It's a matter of who was sending emails to whom. I don't have time to talk much about this network, but it's a very funny one because it's not just some random email network. It's actually an email network of who was sending emails to whom within the company Enron during the last week before the whole company went bust in an enormous scandal. And um, you can, for example, see fun things like that the, the entire board of directors was basically sending no emails. You might know they were more busy improving their golf handicap. Of course, building networks like this is kind of easy because this is structured data. The email itself is not structured data, but the information about who and whom, that's structured data. It's in the header of the email. The problem is that most of the data I'm dealing with, and that's why I have to deal with text mining, is unstructured data. It's unstructured text. It's the biomedical literature. So that's what I was alluding to yesterday in one of the sessions with some of my questions, that really for me, when I want to get the text, the, the, the topic I'm interested in, the papers I'm interested in, it's, sort of, it's this. It's the entire biomedical literature. So I, this is sort of a rough estimate, the 10 kilometers. Of if you take all the papers indexed by the Medline database, it's some 24 million papers. If you say each of them is a five-page article, you print it out on standard 80-gram A4 paper and stack it on top of each other, you get a pile well over 10 kilometers. In reality, with more realistic estimates, it's probably more than 20 kilometers too. But that doesn't really matter. 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, the reality is there's too much to read. I can't read it, you can't read it. So of course, when we can't even read the literature, there's only one thing to do, and that is to get a computer to do it for me. Of course, whenever I have to get a computer to do something that even approaches being halfway intelligent, I get kind of worried. Because it's not what computers are particularly good at. So in, in that context, I find it useful to think of the analogy that a computer is about as smart as a dog. And by that I mean that if I put sufficient effort into it, I can teach it to do very specific tricks. And um, the trick I wanted to uh, to learn is well illustrated by this joke, what we say to dogs. Okay, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage. Understand, Ginger? Stay out of the garbage or else. And of course, the only thing the dog understands is blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger, blah, blah, blah. It understood its own name. I'm slightly more ambitious on behalf of my computer. I wanted to not just recognize its own name, I generally wanted to recognize names of things I'm interested in in the text. I don't expect it to understand all the text. There's gonna be a lot of blah, blah, blah in between that it doesn't understand, but it's gonna pick up the key concepts. And that's what people working in text mining with a fancy name called named entity recognition, which if you think about it for more than a second, you'll realize that means nothing but recognizing stuff with names. And of course, if you want to recognize stuff with names, you need a long list of names, but you also need a text corpus. So the text corpus I'm working on is a Medline abstract primarily and about two million articles, full text. But I plan to expand that with more, hopefully via the cross-ref uh, cross initiatives. Um, besides that, of course, you need the names. You need a comprehensive lexicon. You need to know the names, and you need to know which names are synonyms for different things. So you need to have the synonyms in place. You need to have expansion rules in place, that's a matter of putting in variants of names where even if you build a very comprehensive synonyms list, you're gonna be missing some variants. For example, the same names with certain prefixes or suffixes added to them, in particular with gene names, people might add letters in front of a gene name to tell which organism the gene is from, or they might add endings to it, or 
You just need to deal with that. And if you build dictionaries based on databases, you're not going to get all the relevant variants of all the names. So that's why you need expansions. You also need some flexible matching algorithm to go through the text and recognize the matches to the names. For example, there are issues like matching hyphens and spaces. You might have in your dictionary some name written in one word, but then in the text it might appear as two words, or it might appear as two words written with a hyphen. And um, whereas it's very easy to guess that maybe you can remove spaces, or maybe you can replace a hyphen with a space, or vice versa, it's very difficult to take a long word and start guessing where people might insert hyphens into it. So you need some sort of flexible algorithm for matching it against the text, even when it's not perfect matches. And last but not least, you need a blacklist. And a blacklist is a list of the names that are in your dictionary for all the right reasons. They should be there. They are names of things. They're perfectly valid names. And in some, some cases, they might even be the recommended names by standardization organizations on a certain topic. However, for text mining purposes, they are particularly unfortunate names because when those names appear in the literature, they mean something entirely different. My favorite example of that is in Drosophila genetics, so people studying the genetics of the fruit fly. And they have a gene called A. <laughs> I'm joking. They don't have a gene called A. They have one gene called lowercase a and a different gene called uppercase a. <laughs> so you can imagine how well that's going to fly if you try to do text mining. So obviously, you need to block names like that. Yes, that is a name of a Drosophila gene, but when it says A in the text, chances are they are not talking about the Drosophila gene. Of course, once you've done matching against the text and you know which concepts are mentioned where in the text, you can start looking at which things are mentioned together. And that's where we get back to the guilt by association. So I basically, I do very advanced statistics, also known as counting. So. Um, you know, things might be mentioned together once by chance, but it's fairly unlikely to be mentioned together a lot of times by chance. Of course, it's more likely to happen by random chance that A and B are mentioned together if A and B are mentioned a lot in the literature. So you need to do some statistics on it, but it's really not that advanced. Of course, one topic that often comes up is at which unit of text should you be looking? Should you be looking at whether things are just mentioned in the same documents? Well, you could have things mentioned in the beginning of a paper and an end of a paper, and maybe they really have not much to do with each other, if anything. Maybe you should look within the same paragraph. Maybe you should require it within the same sentence. Well, what I do is I do all of it. I count at all three levels, and then I combine it into one weighted score that overall quantifies how much is A and B mentioned together in the literature compared to how much you would expect them to be mentioned together. And that way I get co-mentioning networks out of entities that are mentioned together in whatever text I'm working on, typically the biomedical literature. So that's all good and fine. Like I said, what I'm mainly interested in is data mining. And that's why what I want to do is actually put this information that I get out of the text with what I get from various other sources. So I've now covered how do we do the text mining? How do we get information out of the literature? But of course, we also, in particular in biology, we have a lot of public databases where people have put together curated knowledge, really the, the information you would find in a biology textbook. And they put together, we know that this protein does so and so, we know that these proteins form certain complexes and that certain processes are catalyzed by certain enzymes, all that kind of information, it is to some extent structured. Of course, those databases are not perfect, they are certainly not comprehensive in terms of our knowledge, otherwise I wouldn't need to do literature mining. But they are there, and they're very high quality for what's in them, and we integrate that, of course. We also integrate more raw experimental data. These days, there's a lot of talk about big data. I really enjoyed the session yesterday on that topic. And especially in biology, again, you have public open repositories where when you publish an article in which you're you've made new data of a certain type, you typically have to deposit that data in this public repository. So we can, of course, download those data from thousands of researchers around the world, reanalyze them jointly, rather than doing the analysis the individual researchers did, and try to put that together and also build networks based on that data. And in some cases, we can also do purely computational predictions. I'm a bioinformatician. There are various prediction algorithms where you might be able to take the sequence of a gene or a protein and make certain predictions about it just based on that. And then finally, and that's one of the reasons why I'm fairly interested in licenses in relation to text mining, 
what I do with this is I make web resources. I make integrated web resources that try to take all the available information on a certain topic, put it together for other people, and make it publicly available. So it's not enough for me that I can get the data and I can mine it, because I don't want it to stay on my own disk. I want to take it, mine it, and make it publicly freely available to everybody in the world. So what do I do, more specifically? Well, one thing we do, there's protein networks. We have a database called the string database that has these fuzzy associations between proteins that are somehow functionally related to each other. This is a very heavily used resource. We have, I think, something like 20,000 unique users every week on that website, so it's a fairly professional operation. And it also adds some other interesting issues in terms of licenses, because this is something that is done as a collaboration between several different institutions in several different countries. So uh, it's a matter of who has rights to what and can do what and how can we put it together. Then we also have an extended version of that, that is chemical network. So in addition to the proteins, we have small molecule compounds such as drugs and metabolites. So drugs can be linked to their drug targets and to the cytochrome P450s that metabolize them and all those things. We can link proteins to where they are in the cell, so subcellular localization, map it onto a pretty picture of a cell and say, given everything we know from text mining, from everything else, where do we think this protein lives in a cell? Or where do we think it's expressed in the human body? Map it onto a body map and say, this protein looks like it's primarily in the liver. We can associate them with diseases and say, given everything we know out there, we think that this protein might be involved in that and that and that disease. The problem, it sounds easy when I'm saying this, but the problems, there are a few. First of all, there are many sources. Both are many sources in terms of getting full text articles from individual publishers. That's an enormous job if I have to run around and contact each individual publisher alone, which is why I'm pleased to see that there seems to be progress on the text and data mining facilities of Crossref. Then there's, of course, the issue of different formats. There's the issue of different identifiers. That's more when we go to databases, that different databases might call the same gene different things. They might call the same protein different things. But you can have those issues as well. If you go to publishers and they don't use DOIs, then each publisher might have their own in-house identifiers for articles and so on, and it can be a real nightmare. Then there's the, uh, what I politely refer to as things being a variable quality. That's the polite way of saying that some of it is really not very good. And um, when it comes to dealing with these problems, most of it is just hard work. Or when I speak to other audiences, I sometimes jokingly refer to it as the solution to this as PhD students. <laughs> that doesn't always go down well with PhD students. Um, but uh, most of it is hard work. Some of it requires a bit of thinking. But really, there's a lot of sources. Well, you have to fetch it from a lot of sources. It's in a lot of different formats. Somebody has to pass a lot of different formats. People use different identifiers. Somebody's got to map them. And it's not high tech. It's just a lot of work. And speaking of a lot of work, how can I make this many resources when it's so much work to do it? Well, the solution to that is collaboration. So I have a collaborative model where I, as a text miner, help people in other places also do text mining on things that I am fairly clueless about. So the way it works is that I work together with people who are domain experts on a certain topic. And they basically provide the answers to the questions what and why. They know what they want to do and they know why they want to do it. So they provide the problem, if you will. And they also provide most of the manpower to solve it because they're the ones who need it solved. Then there's me. I'm the text mining guy, and I can provide the answer to how they're actually going to solve that problem with text mining. So I can provide some of the technology in terms of software that can help them do it. But more importantly, I can give them guidance through the whole process. I wouldn't say it's a standard operating procedure, but it's getting close to that, that we know what you need to do in which order. You know how it has to be done. You know which problems you're likely going to run into, and you know how you're going to solve them if you run into them. So it's incredibly helpful to have somebody on board who has the experience from a, a lot of projects on how to do these kinds of things. An example of this is I'm working together with biodiversity researchers in Greece, and they're interested in marine biodiversity, so they fundamentally want to map organisms to which environments they live in. And currently we're doing that in part by doing text mining of all the text in the database called Encyclopedia of Life. 
And the latest thing we've started doing is to actually also apply text mining to the OCR version of the entire British Heritage Library. So that's not the biomedical literature. This is actually thing, this is books, and it's, uh, things that are, it's books that are not indexed by PubMed or databases like that. But there are other places. It's a different community. There was a place we could get the text, and therefore we were able to do the job. So lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about me as a researcher doing text mining. What is it we need from publishers? And um, at least at other meetings the last couple of years I've been to, there's been a lot of talk about making platforms and how to enable text mining and providing text mining platforms and whatnot. But, but really, it is embarrassingly simple what I want. Because what, what I need is this. I need the text. I, I can take it from there. And I don't care terribly much about the format. Sure, it's nicer to get it in XML than getting it in PDF format, but I can live with PDF format. That's a technical problem. That's hard work. That's PhD students. Um, but what does matter and which PhD students can't solve is licenses. If I get it under a license that doesn't allow me to do what I want to do, then I can't do it. So the end of the story is what I need to do all of these kinds of wonderful things is I need the text and I need the text under a license that allows me to actually do things like make public web resources, redistribute the results of text. Not the text, but the results of text mining. But and if I can get it in a convenient format, that's brilliant. If I can get it from one place, that's even more brilliant. But first and foremost, I just need to get it and get it under a reasonable license. So with that, I just want to thank for your attention and acknowledge a lot of people who did the work I talked about. The work on protein networks and chemical networks is a long-running project called String that started in Pierre Box laboratory at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory at e in EMBL Germany where I spent some years, now it's run partially out of my lab, partially out of the lab of Christian von Mering at the University of Zurich. The work on localization and diseases and text mining for everything else is things happening primarily in my lab. The text mining software that we're using that can deal with these massive corpora was coded by Sune Funkil and myself. Uh, lots of other people have contributed to the various projects. Christian Stolte and uh, Sean O'Donoghue in particular have been heavily involved in the data visualization that I showed you a bit, the visualization of the body, the visualization of the cell, those kinds of things. And Sean was also one of the primary people behind the uh, Reflect tool that was mentioned in, that actually was the tool that won the Elsevier Grand Challenge. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>